glad everyone's here. As you can see, our illustrious worship leader is not here with us today, our fearless leader. So we pulled together a little band, and we're going to sing some songs about things that need to be sung about. There's so much chaos in the world. There's so much unrest, and there's so much confusion. So we built some songs that we know we're not, we're not confused. As Christians are not confused. We know who is, who is Lord Almighty. We know that God is our creator, creator and maker. So join us as we praise God. <coughs> Some glad morning when this life is over i fly away and when i die hallelujah by and by i'll fly away Thank you, Roger, Sharon, Will, Lori. Hey, good morning, uh, Creekside. Good to see everyone in the house today and welcome everyone online to our online community. Uh, this is Creekside Community Church. I'm Pastor Mark, and we're so glad that you've joined us this morning. It's the beginning of August. We know school's around the corner, so a lot of parents and kids are preparing for that. It's going to be a little different this year, but like Roger said, and thank you for that word, Roger, uh, we know, you know, we, we don't know how everything goes about the future but we know who knows the future who controls the future and it's our lord god almighty we're going to be talking about him we're going to talk about our relationship and how we can hear him closer and better in the message so i don't want to hold our worship team up i'm going to pray though i feel led to pray and i want to ask you to pray too because this year teachers are stepping into an entirely different situation amen it's like teaching for the first time with all kinds of other um, extreme things going on. And uh, we're in the Lakeside School Zone. We love all of our schools, Hot Springs, Lake Hamilton. But since we're here close to Lakeside, we have a partnership with ACE that gives back to our community here. So I'm going to pray for Lakeside and all of our schools here and our colleges as well as National Park for everyone to uh, at the end of the month, the middle of the month. So pray with me and then we'll continue in worship. 
Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your presence this morning. We're going to talk about that in our message, about how staying in your presence guides our paths. And Father, bless us today. Come inhabit our praises. Speak to us through song and through your holy word. Father, as I said, I want to pray over everyone that wears the badge of teacher, that is instructing young minds, that are godly teachers. I want to pray first for Lakeside that's close to us as they return with a different kind of schedule, though some is, some is online and some is full-time and some, ha some is a mix of that. Father, I want to pray for Hot Springs School in the center of our city as they go back to school for the the teachers and the administrators. Father, on the opposite end, I want to pray for Lake Hamilton School and all of the other preschools and elementary schools in Garland County. Father, we want to pray for our colleges here, for National Park, and all these teachers and administrators and the students that return back in this very sometimes confusing and difficult time. Father, would you reveal your presence to them? Father, would you Put your peace upon them. And Father, would you protect them from any harm? Father, continue with us now and again. Reveal yourself in new and wonderful ways. And continue to call us to be a point of light, a city on a hill. Help us to make an impact in this community that you've placed us. We thank you for Jesus, for he is our hope. And we pray this in the power of his name. So here it is, y'all. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him and all my love.
sisters in Christ, and we can sing praises to you, Father. We understand you are our all, all in all. You are our Father. Bless Mark now as he comes up, brings the message, and be with us, Lord, through all these troubled times. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, team. Can anyone tell that Roger and Sharon have sang together before? Love the harmony. And thank you, Will and Lori. It's, you know, it's just such a blessing. We have so many talented musical people here and be able to, to switch in and out and still lead us into the presence of God. It's, that's just a blessing. Uh, so again, good morning, church. We're continuing uh, with walking through the lectionary and talking. And actually today actually continues a little bit into something we started last week. It's the rest of the chapter. We've got three passages that we're going to look at today. But as you see by the message title, it's Hearing the Voice of God. Now, I'll plant the seed in to where I'm going to go with this. I want to ask you, put this question in front of your mind. When's the last time you heard the voice of God? And we're going to be unpacking two things. Because to truly hear his voice, you have to be in his presence to hear him proclaim a word to you. So we're going to set that up. Uh, we've got, as we're following along in our scripture uh, text, uh, we're going to look at an Old Testament to look at the nature of God. You know, to be able to hear somebody, you kind of have to have a familiarity with them. You have to know them. And we have to know his qualities, to know how he speaks, to know how he does, and know how he is in our life. And one of the best books for that is we've been using is the Psalms. So our first passage comes from Psalm 105. We're going to start in verses 1 through 6. Here the psalmist says, Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. When's the last time you told somebody how great the God you served was? It says to proclaim him. Let the whole world know what he's done. You know, it's even easier than ever to do that today. If you're on social media, post a scripture. Tell what God's done in your life. You can tell the whole world. Seven, what, seven billion people out there? So you can do it. Sing to him like we did. Yes, sing his praises. Tell everyone about his wonderful deeds. Exult in his holy name. Rejoice, you that worship the Lord. Now look at verse 4. Here's where we get our tie-in. Search for the Lord and his strength continually. 
seek him. Never give up on looking for God, seeking for God, finding his presence. Remember the wonders he's performed, his miracles and the rulings he has given, you children of the servant Abraham, you descendants of Jacob, his chosen one. Jump down to verses 16 through 22. It kind of tells some history with God, with the Israelites. He called for a famine on the land of Cana, cutting off its food supply. Then he sent, notice who sent, God sent someone to Egypt ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. Not the way you actually think a hero would come to a city. They bruised his feet with fetters. They placed his neck in an iron collar. Until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. Then Pharaoh sent for him and set him free. The ruler of the nation opened his prison door. Joseph was put in charge of all the king's household. He became ruler over all the king's possessions. He could instruct the king's aides as he pleased and teach the king's advisors. And that psalm ends with verse 45 saying, All this happened so they would follow his decrees and obey his instructions. Praise the Lord. And in order to follow God's decrees and instructions, you have to be able to, believers, to hear his voice. So that's where we're going. But we're going to look at a continuation from last week. Remember last week, Matthew 14, Jesus did a miraculous deed. He fed the 5,000. And we talked about being mission-minded. Realize that God is always on a mission, and so should we be. And we should have a mission mindset that when the world is topsy-turvy, like the disciples thought, we'll never feed this many people. And they forgot they had Jesus. And remember all the events I gave you? He'd raised the dead. He'd healed lepers. He'd given sight to the blind. He'd cured deaf people's hearing. And the disciples were like, well, what are we going to do for lunch? They forgot they were in God's presence. So we're going to continue because I think there's a really good word for us here. Uh, Verse 22, Matthew 14, right after our story from last week. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. So he's sending the disciples out by himself while he dismissed the crowd, the crowd that he just fed. After he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Here's a free side note. When's the last time you stole away somewhere to pray by yourself? Because when you get alone with God is many a time where you can hear his voice. Somebody say amen. amen. In the stillness, as we will soon, she, soon see from an Old Testament passage. Later that night, so Jesus is on the mountain. Picture this. He's praying. Later that night, he was there alone. Nobody's around but Jesus. And the boat that he'd put the disciples in was a considerable distance from land. A storm had come up, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Now, He prays, it's a little later. I love this next verse. Verse 25, shortly before dawn. And I told you a hint of that last week. Do you realize what's happening here? Jesus is on a mountaintop. He sent the disciples out. A storm comes up, and yet he waits. Some translations will say, and, and the Gospel of Mark says, until the fourth watch of the night. That's the way the Romans put lookouts and how they attended to their soldiers watching the night now the fourth watch of the night begins at three o'clock i'll come back to that put that in your head but he watches them shortly before dawn jesus went out to them he's taking his presence to them if you will walking on the lake when the disciples saw him walking on the lake they were terrified that's another strange thing why are you terrified of jesus you just watched the miracle it's a ghost and Albeit, there might have been fogginess with a storm and heavy rain. You could, it looked like an apparition. I get that. I'm not, I, I never mean to beat the disciples up, but sometimes, and sometimes I'm a lot like them. Anybody identify? Like, I'm not sure this is Jesus, but it looks like Jesus. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately, notice, notice this, Jesus does not want us to be afraid. Jesus immediately said, take courage, it is I. You know what Jesus said? Everything's okay. It's just me. It's just Jesus. And see, if you know Jesus, you know he's there. Amen. If you know Jesus, you can recognize him. 
okay? Take courage, it is I, do, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, now Peter, I was always jumping ahead. We know how Peter's characteristic is. Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water. He actually walks on the water. His faith is strong at the beginning and came toward Jesus. But, man, this is a good time to insert that. You know, that's the problem with a lot of us. We won't get our butts out of the way. Well, I'd like to go help on the mission, but. Well, I'd like to serve more at church, but. But when he saw the wind, he was very afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. What happened to him? He took his eyes off Jesus. And when we take our eyes off Jesus, we begin to sink. Immediate, he cried, Lord, save me. Immediately, second time, there's a problem, and does Jesus wait now? No. Immediately, he thrust his hand out and caught him. You of little faith, why did you doubt? You know what Jesus is saying there? I'm right here, and I always have been. Peter, you shouldn't looked at the wind. Peter, you should have looked upon me. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down and those who were in the boat the 12 and remember these are experienced fishermen they've been in a boat before they know how to take care of a boat they know how to handle rough seas but they fell and worshiped him saying truly you are the son of god now i'm going to ask you again to set up well before i do that let me give you a little backstory it's important in that passage that jesus came to them in the fourth watch of night and raise your hand and in uh, our online community, say amen. Or hey, if you're watching this, top a comment. That's great. We get to interact with you. How many of you have ever woke up late at night, maybe around 3 o'clock for no apparent reason? Raise your hand. Looky there. For our online community, uh, almost the majority raise their hand. Have you ever wondered what's that, what is that for? There is something, I'm going to tell you, there's something special about the fourth watch of the night. There's something special that Jesus picked the hour before dawn. Three to six. It's happened to me many times. And it took me a long time to learn to stop and ask and say, Lord, what are you trying to say? So I'll get my Bible. Or sometimes I'll just go sit on the couch in the living room and just sit in silence. And I'll take a notepad. And sometimes I'll just go into a period of prayer and pray, God, reveal what you're trying to tell me. Or maybe if I've got a big decision on my mind. God is trying to stir me. That's how he's getting our attention. So if you're waking up at 3 or 4 in the morning and you don't know why, make time to go into his presence because he's trying to come to you and he has a word for you and he wants to reveal it. So don't just roll over and nod back off. Okay? We do that. Guess what? Can I tell you, can I tell you something powerful? God forgives us for that. Amen? Amen. <laughs> He knows how we are, you know? Just like, can you imagine Jesus in that moment when he looks at Peter? I don't, you know, Peter almost made it all the way and he falls. Don't you, I, I want to think that Jesus is smiling a little bit. I don't think he was chastising Peter with hard words, you a little faith. I think he was kind of grinning, shaking his head like, man, he ain't got it yet. Come on, buddy. I do, because I think that's how Jesus is, with love and compassion. I think he's a teacher and encourager rather than a chastiser. Oh, he will speak to sin, and he had a lot to say to the religious elite. But hear me, hear me, church. For his children and followers that he loves, he speaks love. Amen? He speaks encouragement. He speaks compassion. That's why so many people loved him. So I want to plant this seed. How, how does God speak to you? We have an example in the Bible. It's found in the Old Testament to one of his prophets, Elijah. Let me give you the backstory before we go into God speaking to Elijah. There's an evil ruler, king and queen, Ahab and Jezebel. We don't ever want to name anybody Jezebel. You don't want people acting like Jezebel. There's even a thing called a Jezebel spirit. Jezebel was wanting to kill all the people of God, especially the prophets, especially Elijah, who was saying how wicked you are. It, it, was, not a, 
it was not a popular vocation to be a prophet in the Old Testament. It usually ended badly for you. So to answer God's call to be a prophet and speak against people was not, they weren't standing in line for that position. So Elijah is a faithful prophet. If you know your Old Testament, if you kind of grew up in church and Sunday school, Elijah is the guy that called down fire against the prophets of Baal. Elijah was doing mighty things for God, but even he has, I don't know if I can quite call it a wavering moment. Sometimes we just need to be reassured, amen? Sometimes we, do, we just need to know and feel God is there. God is. Sometimes we need to recount the stories of the victories in our life that God has showed up. And I've, I've, you've heard me said from the stage, from the pulpit here, we don't share those stories enough of the wins that God gives us as the people of God. Let's get into the passage. 1 Kings 19, 9 through 18. He's the Elijah. Then he went into a cave and spent the night. He's on the run because Jezebel and Ahab are trying to kill him. They've already killed prophets. And the word of the Lord came to him. Notice that phrase. What are you doing here? Let, let me expound on that briefly. I don't, we don't know by the text. I mean, look at the text. I don't know if this was an audible word. I don't know, as we're going to see, it's an internal word. I don't know if it was just a feeling came over him. The, the text actually doesn't give us that. But it does say the word of the Lord came to him. I don't know if Elijah called up a promise from God from the Psalms or the Old Testament text. The word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Time out. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you're the only one making a difference from God, for God and you're getting beat up about it? Well, Elijah, that's, that's where he's at. He says, God, man, I, I am on fire for you. I love you. I'm pushing the envelope, and guess what? They're killing prophets, and now I'm the only one here. And they're trying to kill me. Verse 11, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain. Stand in what? Look at the text. Where? In the presence of the Lord. To hear the Lord, you have to be in his presence. And we'll show you these two tie together every time. For the Lord is about to pass by. Watch what happens. First, then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart. That'd been a sight to behold. And shattered the rocks before the Lord. Notice. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. The earth shook. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. You ought to underline this passage. Highlight it on your iPad. After the fire came a gentle whisper. Do you want to know how God speaks to us today? Same way he talked to Elijah. It's not all about flashiness and theatrics and a show. It's in those quiet, still moments when we humble ourselves and come into God's presence. After the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replies again, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And I am the only one left, and they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord now gives him an instruction. Go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there to Hazel, over, king over Aram, also anoint Jehu, son of the Nishmi king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Japhat, from Abel Malhola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Jehu. Look at verse 18, very, very important. Remember Elijah has said twice, I'm the only one that cares. I'm the only one left. It's so funny, at the end of the word of the Lord to Elijah, 
God says this, Yet I've reserved 7,000 in Israel whose knees have not bowed to Baal and whose mouth has not kissed him. Do you know what that means? As crazy as we may think or see the times going, God will always have a remnant of his people. Always. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and what? The gates of hell will not prevail. Satan is running rampant. More than, There are dark things happening by what we're seeing out in our social scenes. But I want to encourage you to take courage because the gates of hell will never prevail against the church of Christ, against the kingdom of Christ, and against God's people. He will always have a faithful remnant that will not bow down to idols, that will not accept darkness. And that's an encouragement. Now, I'm going to give you five points to unpack on how to get closer, but I just feel led to share briefly. I can't get up here and talk about listening to God. Some of you have heard a little of this, but I'm just going to tell briefly how I've experienced it. And I experienced it as gentle whispers. The year was 2007. I had the best secular job I had ever had in my life. I was a sales marketing analyst for a company called Mtech. Uh, some of y'all can appreciate this in the workforce. It's way different than it is now. My, we were a company. We made injection mold parts for Honda, Nissan, and Toyota. And my, I was assigned to the Nissan division. So my job was staying on the phone arguing over parts prices with three Nissan buyers. It was a Japanese-owned company. We were about 1,500 employees. They had five plants across the U.S. And when you're in a big corporation, one of the big, my insurance, my insurance for my whole family was $38 a month. That's full everything. It's not that now. And some of y'all know that as well. I was preaching part-time at a small country church that I had come with an opportunity out of the, a larger church that Tammy and I were attended since we'd married. And so I just felt, first with me, I felt a stirring in my soul to do more. I wanted to do more in the city. We were in Manchester, Tennessee, in Middle Tennessee. And I talked to Tammy a little bit about it. I worked there four and a half years, and in the fourth, middle of that fourth year, I'm sitting at my desk one day. I'm working Excel. My, my life, I live my life in Excel spreadsheets with part numbers and prices and all that. And most of the, most of the, we had about 15 in our office. And most of the people had gone out to lunch and I, I had to catch up on some work. And I was just working away. And I felt, I have to say a presence, but I felt a gentle whisper come over me that said this I didn't make you to work spreadsheets and I just paused and I thought so I finished the rest of my day I went home and told Tammy I said well I had a kind of interesting thing happen today well, what happened I said I was busy working and I said that I call, and I've, I'd called him and I'd had a great mentor a pastor who had mentored me from junior high, he called him gentle whispers. I felt it was a gentle whisper, and I knew the Elijah passage. And I said, I think the, the Lord is speaking a word to me. And it's always good when you hear a word and then you have somebody you trust, a spouse, a friend, family, fellow believer, if they confirm that. And the first words out of Tammy's mouth was this. I don't think you'll ever be happy unless you try full-time ministry. So in May of 2007, we started to put in ministry applications all over the U.S. I mean, I put in a bunch, all different flavors. I also put in some secular applications for because I was working about 80 hours a week with this corporation. I also put in an equal amount of secular applications for less hours, not less pay, hopefully, 
so that I wanted to do something there in Manchester. I wanted to kind of maybe do a church plan or, or do some kind of mission work. And we were doing stuff with the church up on the mountain. And they were a congregation of senior saints. It was like having five sets of grandparents. It was great. It was really small, about 25 or 30 people. It was a great season of our life. But in about a week's time, one by one, those secular applications got turned down. Hiring freeze, too qualified, not qualified enough, not hiring right now. And we went for about a month and didn't hear anything back from any of the churches. And then in one 24-hour period, we heard, we got letters and emails from four churches. I'd sent out my resume. I'd sent out a sermon. See, that everybody wants to hear how you sound. This was before Facebook Live. Like I said, this was 2007. And we had four replies. Florida, Texas, Colorado, and Alabama. And they all said the same thing. Hey, we got your CD. We'd like you to come in. We'd like to talk with you about being the lead pastor of our church. And we were just floored. Tammy and I just praised the Lord and like, well, this God's answered. And in the summer of, two, in July of 2007, we visited all those places and we ended up in Alabama. We felt drawn to that body of believers there. Felt we prayed over it, had our prayer warriors pray for us. And I share that, and I want you to hear that. That didn't happen because I was pastor. That happened because I was a believer who listened to the word of God that came to me, and you can too. You just have to be sensitive and put, your place, put yourself in a posture or a place where God can speak. So here's five points that I, out of these two passages, here's five points that worked for me and I think will work for you. Number one, we must never forget we're in God's presence even if we don't feel like we are. You ever been there? You know the classic footprints picture? The one set of footsteps and the person says, well, hey, Jesus, you said you would walk beside me. Well, that's when I picked you up and carried you. Why is it we don't think he's there? Why is it we don't experience him? We don't feel his presence. We don't hear his voice. We must never forget we're in God's. If you're today, if you are a born again believer in Christ, you can come into the presence of God. You should be in his presence daily. After all, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit lives in you. You are the temple of God. And so we ought to be prompted and guided by that. Number two, when we fail to remember point one, we will have struggles. Most Christians get themselves into trouble when they get out of God's presence. Somebody say amen. Amen. When you're not listening to God, when you're not, when you're not congregating with people of God, when you're doing things you ought not to do that you know will cause grief to God, that's when you have struggles. Stay in God's presence. Number three, and we need to realize this now because this is happening right now. When everything around us is falling apart, it doesn't mean that we should too. David said, though 10,000 fall around me, I will take courage in you. Do you have that faith? Do you have that courage? I mean, if you look at the right channels and outlets, the world's going fast to hell in a handbasket. But just because everything, you know, it's almost two-sided. Just because everything's different and crazy right now, again, there is an opportunity as much as there are obstacles. It's now a time to witness and share Jesus and the gospel more than ever because people are returning to him. Roger shared a story with me yesterday while we were down here prepping for today. There's a, a church here in this county out way out in a rural part. Uh, out, actually, it's outside of the county, out in Glenwood. And they're just a little country church, but they're seeing exponential growth. And get this, the demographic is the 30-somethings. And Roger having this conversation with the guy who says, we've even had to cut trees to make a bigger parking lot. What a great problem to have. And he said, well, what do you account for the growth of this? And you know what he said? People are scared of what's going on. People are seeking security and faith. 
and there's all kinds of dark things happening, people need to know, do I know Jesus? Am I in his presence? Just because everything around us is falling and going crazy does not mean Christians do. And I've seen some Christians lose their mind on the internet social sites, amen? Where they're not, they're not speaking what they should be speaking. That's all I'm going to say about that. Number four, believers, followers of Jesus, believers are always part of God's plan, and God's plan always works out. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. If you love Jesus, it's going to work out for good. And God's plan always works out. You got to realize you're part of that plan if you're a born again believer. You got to have that faith. You got to have that courage. And last but not least, as we said from the Kings, First Kings passage, God chooses not to speak in loud fanfares and huge things, but rather would like for us to be still and hear his gentle whispers. Are you hearing the voice of God in your life? When's the last time you made quite still time and said, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Just like Samuel did. After God, he thought Eli, the priest. Remember Samuel's story? Three times. And the old priest said, Next time it happens, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Next time, have you ever put yourself in a still place and just set before the Lord and said, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. You ought to try it sometimes and see, see what gets revealed to you. Are you hearing the voice of God in your daily life? And let me tell you, I'm going to close with this. Let me tell you why that's so important. We come back to the source. We come back to Jesus. In John 10, 4 and 5, Jesus said this. They follow because they know my voice. They won't. He's talking about believers. He's talking about his children. He's talking about those who follow him. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him. Why, Jesus? Because they don't know his voice. They follow me because they know my voice, Jesus said. He's, John 10, he's telling he's the great shepherd, the good shepherd. He goes ahead, the sheep, the sheep follow him, and the sheep come out because they know the tone of his voice. I've told this story, all my three kids, when Tammy and I were in the grocery stores and I heard that cry, I knew that was my kid. I knew that voice, and they know my voice. But the biggest question for us as followers of Jesus are you hearing God's voice? Are you hearing the Lord's voice? Are you hearing the gentle whispers of the Holy Spirit? Because if you're not, I lovingly want to encourage you, you need to move closer into his presence. If you haven't heard his voice in a while. Because Jesus says, my, I mean, you can't argue that down. You don't need a commentary for this. Jesus point blank says, if you belong to me, you'll hear my voice. And it could be from opening the word. It could be in a quiet time before God. It can be in prayer. It can even be from another believer coming up and saying, hey, have you ever considered doing this mis ministry mission? God can, it, it, it can be even from a song on the radio that just hits you and inspires you. Say, you know, man, I've never thought of that. See, we've, the God that made the universe can talk in any medium he chooses to. Amen? You can see an inspirational... I, sometimes I felt led just to post a certain scripture on Facebook, and sometimes I preface it like, I don't know who needs this today, but this hit me. I've never had anyone not respond. Usually people say, I needed that today. What, what prompted me to put it on so all my friends and family could see it? I don't know, but I give it praise to God, and I give God all the glory and credit for it. So I close, are you hearing God's voice? If you're not, you need to move deeper, closer into his presence. Because I fully believe this, beloved. Now, this time, this pandemic, 
this season, where we're at as a country, nation, and world, we need to hear God's voice above everything else. Because there's enough voices that are voices of the stranger out there, and you may get duped by them if you don't know what the master sounds like. And it would break my heart for any of our family or anybody I get the privilege and honor to serve and minister to find out they listen to the wrong voice. Hear the Savior say, as that old hymn goes. I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to enter communion, and then Raj and the praise team will come back up. Pray with me. Father, I just let that little bit of quietness happen to remind us that we need to approach you in a quiet time. We need to approach you in all humbleness. We need to make more quiet time in our life so that we can hear you clearly. We need to be obedient to those wake-up calls you give us at 3, 4, 5 in the morning to come before you and say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I pray, Father, through this teaching, through your teaching, not mine, I am just the messenger that you will encourage this crowd and all who are with us online to strive, to press in, to lean in, to hear your voice. And if they're out of your presence, God, would you call them back? Would you reveal your presence so they're more entreated to come in and know you and hear your voice and what it sounds like and by all means, Lord, would you let none that have been attributed here, none of our family and no believers ever be led astray by the voice of the stranger, the evil one, our biggest opposition, the devil. Would you give us clarity? And from last week, would you give us discernment? Would you help us be mission-minded? Would you help us be gospel-minded, Father, so we can share in these difficult times? God, help us to hear what you are speaking because you are constantly speaking to us. Jesus, may we always hear your voice and never follow the voice of the stranger. In your name, Lord, I pray. Amen. At Creekside, we practice open communion. If you're a believer in Christ and for you online, we encourage you to participate in this sacrament of the church, this ordinance of the church. Uh, we're going to pray over the bread and the cup. Jesus took this in his last days and gave it to us as a memorial feast uh, to, to reverence him. He instructed us to do it until he, until he comes. It is symbolic of his death, burial, and resurrection. So I'm going to pray over the bread and the cup, and then let's partake it together. Father God, thank you for Jesus and the gift that he gave us, the gift that leads to salvation, to life eternal, that he freely offered his body to a cross, and he freely let his blood to be shed that washes us white as snow. So in this memorial feast of communion, bless us as we partake of the bread and the cup. In your name we pray. Amen. You may partake. Another act of worship that we do is our giving of tithes and offerings. You, uh, we have a box marked out for that that you can drop uh, anything in, any financial uh, gift that you would like to give. We have a great online, we have an app called Givelify. Uh, just go to Givelify. It's on our website as well, www.cometocreekside.org. And you can do that. You can even schedule it up to be a monthly, a weekly, however it's easy for you to keep up with. It gives you printed out statements. It's great for your tax purposes. It's called Givelify. You might want to check that out. It's really the easiest way uh, to be uh, giving to the ministry and the mission here so that we can bless others. We got a chance to bless Change Point Pregnancy Center last week with some very much needed baby food and baby supplies, and we've got seven prominent community partnerships that we continually support. So be thinking of that, be praying about that in that time. I'm going to ask Roger and the team to come up.
Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for listening so attentive. I ask you to search these scriptures, look them over. I ask you if you can from your workplace, if you're off tomorrow, tomorrow at 9 o'clock on our Creekside Community Church Facebook page, I'll be live with my Monday motivational Devo, talking of telling a, uh, one story and sharing some scriptures. You can join me for that, usually somewhere between five and eight minutes, but it hopefully will help kick your week off for a good, encouraging week. And encouraging, I ask you to enter the presence of God this week, make some quiet, still time for Him, and see what He has to say to you. Peace to your house, and God bless you. Y'all stay seated for a second. Will is going to bless us with a beautiful tune that we all know. So sit here and soak in the words that you know to this tune.
This be our final thought. And we'll just sing voices only if you don't care. Let's stand. One chorus of Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love. Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. We're dismissed. We're dismissed.